Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started in just a minute. Shall I share my screen? Oh. Not yet, Joe. Okay. Abby, I am ready whenever you are. All right, let's kick it off. Happy Friday, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us to learn about the underwater landscapes, canyons, valleys that make up the Gulf of Maine's dynamic seafloor. And the researchers that have spent many years mapping this fascinating area with a variety of tools and methods. Dr. Joe Kelly, professor of marine geology at the University of Maine, is here to share air about the Gulf of Maine's incredible underwater landscape and why the ocean floor is such an interesting place to explore. This is Dr. Kelly's second appearance in our Lunch and Learn series. His presentation last September, The Geology of the Maine Coast, has been viewed more than 1,400 times on YouTube, making him a Lunch and Learn legend. Welcome back, Joe. You might have noticed that I'm not Kathleen Neal, my beloved boss. My name is Abby Bradford. I am our outreach manager for Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 8, members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCA by influencing public policy holding politicians accountable and winning elections. A few technical notes for today's event. We'll hear from Joe and tackle questions in the Q&A session at the end, but you don't have to wait. You can send your questions to me through the chat as they occur to you, and I'll keep track of your questions to ask. Please message Will Sedlak with any technical difficulties. We like to give him the hard questions. Lastly, this event is being recorded and we'll share the video with you later this afternoon in a follow-up email. And you can also find it on our website with all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thanks again for joining us. And Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, am I here? You're here, Joe. Okay, thank you. Well, um, today uh, we will talk about uh, the seafloor and you can see it in front of you right there. Uh, it's not an area many of us get to see. Um, and I'm actually looking at this through this image through uh, a submersible, but we'll look at some areas. I, I don't know what I thought was out there. I, I was asked once by a kid who was there and I asked him what he thought. I was leaving a field trip and he thought, well, it's probably sandy and then it gets muddy. and well, it does those things, but you'll see that there are other things that it does as well. So let me begin with a little backdrop. Um, you can see in the in the map on the on the top there, um, we are in the red box, uh, and this is a map of the world showing areas in the dark blue that are paraglacial, meaning they were glaciated at some point, often very often in the past. Um, and paraglacial geomorphology, what it means is that the earth has been conditioned by glaciation where we live. It's really affected by it. A lot of the materials brought here, uh, the landscapes uh, were formed by glaciers. Though the glaciers are no longer here, it really marks it as a very different place on the East Coast than any place south of where glaciation occurred, south of New York City. Here's just a, a map showing the, the really the profound nature of the damage of uh, the damage while well, the destruction that the glaciers wrought. The LGM is the late glacial maximum. That's the most extreme extent the ice reached in the last ice age. Notice that south of that, south of Long Island, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, see those lines, those bathymetric contour lines, those are lines of equal depth. So if you walked on one of those, you wouldn't change elevation. Um, and notice that they're regular, they, they're spaced nice. It's a gently sloping seabed from Long Island, New York, or New Jersey, out to the continental slope where it drops off precipitously. But in the Gulf of Maine, it doesn't look like that because the glaciers have visited this area many times. 
And uh, each time they take away a little bit. That material down there south of New York is called the coastal plain. It's sand and mud that, that eroded from the Appalachian Mountains over truly hundreds of millions of years. But much of that is gone from our Gulf of Maine because of glaciation. So we'll look at this particular area. I won't go deeper than about oh, 200 feet or so, 60 meters, because that's as low as my interests have ever really, um, have ever really been. So a little other background, glaciation. So we were glaciated. Well, the glaciers brought us materials and, and that's really important. On the upper left, you can see uh, an ice tunnel from Glacier Bay, Alaska. Uh, and it's a tunnel in the ice. It, it goes many miles there up into the high mountains. And uh, th this glacier is melting and it's melting fairly rapidly actually. And meltwater gets into this channel eventually and it rushes out at phenomenal velocity carrying basketball sized boulders and hurling them a good hundred feet from the opening to this ice tunnel. Well, that would have been what the main coast was like um, 15,000 years ago. And a lot of the mud that came out of that ice tunnel is manifest on our landscape as this glacial marine mud. It, it is ultimately the product of an ice tunnel. It's mud that was just came out of the ice tunnel and then was blanketed the landscape. You can see how finely layered it is in this uh, terribly eroding outcrop in Brunswick, Maine. So why was there ocean there? The ice weighed a great deal. It pushed down on the Earth's crust and the ocean just followed the melting glaciers uh, back in. The glaciers left other things. Um, glaciers always move forward under their own, under their own weight. Um, so they're always moving forward, but they eventually reach a place where they're melting at the same rate they're moving forward and they, they appear to pause, but they're still bringing material to that melting location. And as a result, a pile of material accumulates and it's called a moraine. And it marks the terminus or the, or the position of the ice at a given time. You can see the air photo of the upper left. That's a ground photo of the same location on the upper right. Um, and it's boulders, but beneath the boulders, there's sand and mud and a mixture of things of that sort. Um, you can see the aerial photo of um, the Machias area on the bottom and showing a large moraine that once blocked the entirety of Machias Bay. It's eroded now. You can see the gravel beach that's resulted from that. Most of our bays were at one time or another uh, blocked by moraine. They were lakes, in fact, before they became bays. The final one, I, I would never have brought this up until recently, uh, an esker is the ice tunnel deposit, the sand and gravel that doesn't just blanket the landscape that remained within the ice tunnel. And you can see these are channel-like deposits. They, they exist commonly near bodies of water in Maine, dividing Thompson Lake there, going over some wetlands. Uh, and normally I wouldn't, I, I never showed this because you don't see that underwater until last year, one was discovered. So I, I thought I would, just show them as an example. Um, the last thing is, when did all this happen? What, when, when did this glaciation affect our coastline and our offshore? You can see from these maps, these are thousands of years ago. Uh, these are calibrated ages. So this is pretty much calendar years. Um, about 15,000 or so years ago, the ice was at the main coast and actively melting back and retreating rather rapidly. And you can see how it has stepped back incrementally from the late glacial maximum in New York City. Okay, in this talk, we're gonna be underwater. So what you're looking at is a graph of how the ocean level has changed in this part of the Gulf of Maine. On the far right, we're at zero elevation, meaning sea level, and that's time zero today. If we go to the, the far left side of the graph, we can go back to 15,000 or so years ago when the glaciers were melting back across the coast of Maine. Their weight pushed the crust of the earth down and the ocean was 70 to 80 meters above its present location at that time. Um, but as the ice melted back, that land rebounded to its, its normal elevation, if you would, really rapidly. And sea level fell uh, as a consequence of the land rising out of the ocean. The land is not rising rapidly like this out of the ocean in Scandinavia and Sweden, certainly and in you know, northern Canada, Hudson Bay, uh, other places that have relatively recently been deglaciated. So that happened here, and we went to what I labeled there a low stand, the lowest point that the ocean would get, about 200 feet below present or 60 meters below present, 
about 12,500 years ago. At that point, it probably paused for a while. The ocean was still trying to rise, but the land had been rising. The land slowed its rate of rise and the ocean rapidly moved across it. You can see the graph shoot up really rapidly. We don't record much from that interval of time offshore because it happened so quickly. But then we go into a long period of slow sea level rise that allowed materials to accumulate in salt marshes and on beaches. And we see a very good record of that interval of time. Lots of archeology span sites uh, along the intercontinental shelf of the Gulf of Maine. They were drowned, however, the sea level rose rapidly once more, and then slowly it has risen to the present day. So what kind of data did we, did we how do you collect that? What do you do offshore? Well, uh, I had never really done this exactly, but I knew of things like this. And we began by collecting bottom samples, just collect, I'll show pictures of these in a minute, but all the little red X's you see there were samples taken. We've got about, oh, I don't know, about 25, 2,600 sample locations. If we hit rock, in other words, the sampler came up with nothing in it, we drop it three times. And if we didn't get anything, that was the definition of rock. On this, you see many other kinds of lines and I'll, I'll explain those, but those are geophysical lines and we'll, we'll look at some of those. So we took all of that information. Uh, my, my PhD student, Walter Barnhart, put that into a geographic information system where we could overlie all these things. And, um, and so we have a repository of all that information. So how do you sample the, the bottom? Well, this is a bottom sampler. Uh, it's called a Smith McIntyre, named after the two uh, inventors uh, in, in the University of Rhode Island. So people have asked me these things before, so I'm going to say things in advance. How much do these things cost? They're not cheap. This was fairly inexpensive. This was about seven or eight thousand dollars thirty years ago. So you figure it's probably ten thousand or so today. All stainless steel, and it goes down. It triggers when it hits the bottom and just takes a sample of whatever was there. You can see in the upper left there was a worm. It was still moving, probably very unhappy, coming from cold, deep, dark water. Uh, heavy pressure on him to suddenly being uh, off Cape Elizabeth. Um, but we get a perfect sample of the seabed that way and we can, we can take that back to a laboratory. And it has to represent an area. If you're gonna make a map that way, each sample is thought to represent well, a fairly large area. One sample, one place, in fact, this was off, uh, that's right off uh, Cape Elizabeth. We got a Coke bottle and <laughs> that was intended to represent about 10 uh, square kilometers of the ocean bottom because that's what we got there. But I'm sure that bottom is not littered with Coke bottles. It was just a, a chance encounter. Other uh, techniques we use, uh, this is a multi-beam bathymetry. Um, I'm sitting on a boat with another graduate student and you can see in the upper right, some of the equipment, they're black boxes. Um, but they basically let this device send out about, oh, I don't know, a couple of hundred bathymetric soundings a second. It keeps track of where each one is. So I get back instantly uh, as I collect this information, uh, the latitude, the longitude of each one of these hundreds of bathymetric soundings, the depth, as well as a measure of how strongly the signal reflects back, the hardness. That device, I bought last year, a couple of years ago for $85,000. I just sold it to some friends for 10,000. But this is what it produces and it's just amazing. This was Emily Chandler's master's thesis. You can see the box on the right is a little section of the Damascotta River estuary near where the university has a research station. And on the left side, you can see the bathymetric map on the far left with its depth shaded um, and the hardness map, the, the backscatter, how strongly we got a signal back if it was reddish, it was probably rock and reflected 100% of the sound back. If it's blue, it was mud and didn't reflect very much of the sound back at all. But it's a, a very good measure of what's on the bottom as well as how deep it is. It's amazing that these devices can do this so quickly. That device could not have been built to do that kind of work uh, 20 years ago. Uh, other devices, um, these uh, geophysical devices, they're all using sound. Um, the uh, one on the, on the right image, the two white cylinders there, the catamaran, which you can see being towed, sends sound down and it's called seismic reflection. And it, 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 it sends the sound through the seabed and it reflects off layers that exist beneath the seabed. The yellow torpedo-like device 
on the right side uh, is towed underwater, as near to the bottom as you, as you dare to get it. And it only looks, it sends sound down, but it only sees the seabed. So it could see cracks in a rock, it can see boulders, it can see lobster traps. Uh, and when they run together, you see these things simultaneously. So on the right-hand side, the upper um, image is, a, is the seabed. It's a seismic reflection image. I'm looking down through the bottom, tens of meters down. I can see the modern mud on the surface. I can see where bedrock exists beneath the surface. Very useful if you were planning to do some engineering work out there to know how thick the, the bottom is. And on the lower image there, you can see the side scan sonar image. It's 100 meters to either side of the boat. So it's a 200 meter swath. Mostly it's mud, you see the white, um, but you can see where we went over that bedrock in the seismic reflection. There's all this rocky area. You see it's dark, reflects the sound strongly. And the little light speckles you see are boulders that are probably you know, uh, you know, several feet in diameter. On the left side, it's a similar sort of thing. The seismic reflection profile um, shows you a gentle seabed dipping to the left and areas where suddenly ripples appeared on the bottom on the side scan sonar. But I can see why, because the glacial marine mud is just starting to crop out there and it has a little bit of sand in it. You can see shipwrecks with side scan sonar. This was a, a place we used to go to uh, very often with students to see if they were paying attention to the device. Um, this is about, uh, you can see the scale there. Uh, this is off Searsport. And if you look closely, you can, you, you can see it. Where it's white, it's in acoustic shadow. So for some, it was the orientation of where I was towing the device. I can't see what is white, um, but I can see the dark and you can see the mast of the boat. And it looks like cables that might've been supporting the mast. You can also see a line drawn across the bottom. That was a very sad fishing person who, um, I probably lost his, his gear not knowing this wreck was there and dragged uh, over it. Um, those devices cost uh, hundreds and hundreds, half a million dollars between them. Uh, and then a coring device. I want to go down. I want to, I want to sample this. So this is a vibrating core. In the upper and the image on the left, you can see that red box. Um, and it vibrates with a high, high frequency in three dimensions. If you touch it, when uh, touch that pipe when it's running, it feels like you're, you're, the bones in your arm will just, just vibrate right out. Um, the device is <clears throat> attached to 200 pounds of lead on the bottom. It goes over the side. There's a 200 pound uh, Norwegian fishing buoy at the top that holds it vertical. So it isn't gonna go in at some angle. And it's dropped to the bottom. When we hit the bottom, we can sense that there's, there's no tension on the cable. And we push a button for about 20 seconds and it vibrates right down through the bottom. It'll go right to the top of that pipe uh, and then it will stop. And then we bring it back up. It has something to catch what's in it. And so we bring it up. It's a, you know, this is about a, oh boy, this is about $150,000 device. But even the, the core barrels are $1,000 a piece. And we get that pipe up on the deck, we pull out a plastic liner, which you can see on the right, which has the core in it. We cut it down the middle, it's about three inches in diameter. And you can see the glacial marine mud that we cored into and above that, uh, some modern sand and gravel from off of uh, Mount Desert Island. Finally, um, submersibles, boy, the, these were $10,000 a dive on average and we've had a lot of them. That was the National Undersea Research Program, and we intended to go down mostly to ground truth to be sure of what we were seeing with this geophysical equipment. Uh, we later graduated from that because it was so expensive to a remotely operated vehicle where you, you, you pay your 100000 and you've got this cool device that you can, it's like a video game. You can dive down, you can go up or down or sideways. It has a, a sampling arm, uh, all manner of uh, interesting things on it. So we can get nice imagery of the bottom. So that's the backdrop. This is the, 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 the seabed, and this is just a map of it. It's called physiography, meaning landforms. And there's a handful here, and I'll go through them one by one fairly quickly. Uh, you can see, I've highlighted red, the rocky zone. Much of the seafloor is, uh, is rocky, um, about almost half of it, in fact. Meaning with a bottom sampler, we didn't, we didn't come up with anything and geophysical lines suggested there wasn't anything to come up with. Most of this is in shallow water. Um, 
On the upper right, you can see a side scan sonar image. And there's a line that the device is towed down the middle. It's 100 meters to either side, like a football field. You can see cracks. This is all rock with some gravel between the cracks. On the left side, you can see the seismic reflection line. We can't see through bedrock, so we don't really see anything there. It's just a, a very hard, nasty looking bottom. In fact, off Kennebunk, where this was collected, we generally turn it off when we used to collect records in paper because it wasted paper and it cost a lot of money. I didn't think there was anything to see there. And then I think the University of New Hampshire collected the, the multi-beam image you see. And that is an esker. I, I never believed there were eskers offshore, but I can't think of what else it might be. On that image, the lowest stand of sea level was in the dark blue area. So that esker had sea level was once above it, it fell below it, reworking it, waves striking on it. it would have been a strange, long, linear island. And then sea level came back up and went over it one more time. And so its surface is probably really hardened with boulders, but it shed a great deal of sand. Uh, there were beaches associated with it. You can see those little stringers that come off to the side with probably barrier islands and spits associated with it. Would have been a great time, but, um, but, it, but it ended, it drowned eventually. As did all of these features. Um, so a lot of the rocky bottom isn't necessarily pure bedrock. It's just a really hard bottom. And here uh, are moraines near the, the, the community of Wells. You can see them in the multi-beam on the upper right. And then I zoomed in on a side scan image on one. Again, they're moraines, they've, they've had the ocean, they were deposited and then they were drowned underwater. Um, they then emerged as the land lifted back up and sea level went to its low stand, and then they drowned one more time. So they, they shed a great deal of sand and gravel by waves crashing against them for quite a long time. So you can see in that upper bathymetric map, all the yellow and light green, the sand and gravel eroded from these, from these many moraines. They would have been beautiful uh, barrier islands and beaches for a long time, similar in some respects to the beaches in the Wells area today. Um, cutting through the rocky zone from all these harder rock areas are shelf valleys, and they are truly enigmatic. Uh, they don't represent much of the of the the the, the, the seafloor, eight or nine percent, and they're concentrated in deeper water. They all head up into shallower water, and on the map you can see they go into bluer areas. It's they simply they go on as deep valleys cut into rock, but in that blue area you'll see in a minute, uh, it, it's covered by mud, they're all filled in. This was the original map someone made, Douglas Johnson made on the right, back in, probably in the, in the, in the teens, um, maybe the early 20s, he published it in 1925. He, he wrote the book uh, when he was a soldier in World War I. And what he did is he hired graduate students from Columbia to go out on fishing boats off Maine and to do bathymetric soundings. And again, before there was GPS, before there was any kind of electronic navigation, um, they would have to have a good clear day. So you can see on the, on the graph they've drawn, that, that red line from west to east, they've graphed their bathymetric soundings. Um, they had this go over Isla Ho, I guess I, I kind of covered that. But what was striking to me is the deep valley, the blue arrow that points there right near um, the present city of Rockland. Uh, that's a really deep valley. That's, uh, those are in fathoms. So that's uh, almost, that's 400, 500 feet deep. While he didn't know what it was doing there, there's, it's underwater today. So he assumed the Gulf of Maine was once like land and it had rivers. And he, he drew this map, which you can see on the right. It's an interesting historic map because it's not really accurate at all. He doesn't even have all of the ledges on. Um, he's got Platts Bank and Pippinese. Uh, he's got Jeffrey's Bank, but not Jeffrey's Ledge. So some of it's there, but it was the first information there was. And he concluded this had been a fluvial landscape. The land was some, for some reason uplifted. The father of modern uh, marine geology, Francis Shepard, followed in his, in his wake and said, no, 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 this, this, this is because this area was glaciated. All glaciated areas look like this offshore. And he was correct in that. But both were probably incorrect in their, in their conclusion about how this formed. This is looking at that valley. This is again right off Rockland. And you can see the bathymetric map on the right. The deep area there is extremely deep, is uh, almost 500 feet deep. 
and it's channel like if you look on the hardness which is just telling us how strongly the the sound is reflecting off the bottom it's mostly bare rock but you can see the channels that have been cut through this they're found in places uh, today uh, that have uh, active glaciers and today we believe that there were lakes beneath the ice as there are in many places in the world and the lakes broke out and they released catastrophically enormous volumes of water that was charged with sand and boulders and, and gravel and cut these river-like forms probably very, very quickly as the lakes uh, discharged. That's the best effort I've, I've, I've heard on how these might have formed. Uh, beyond that, we really don't know. Don't think they were cut by rivers though. Uh, just another picture of one. Uh, this is near um, Blue Hill uh, Bay, and you can see the, the deep channel there in the dark blue, and there's a cross section, and I'll show you of it in a minute. In that upper area in the green, the B, B prime, we did a video tour here. A man, a fishing person came up with, uh, he was dredging for scallops and came up with a, a stone arrow, not an arrow, he had a spearhead, a really big one, right in that area, so we thought we'd go look for it. <laughs> it's a big ocean. You can see the cross section uh, from A to A prime, the deep valley is certainly there. The video is from more toward the middle of the right side. And each one of those little jagged things you see in the top is an individual image. We towed a device over the bottom. At first, it's fun to look at these, but after an hour or so, you realize it is a big ocean and you're looking for something the size of your foot. Uh, we never found anything with the video, the video camera. So these valleys go up into nearshore basins and the basins uh, are a fairly large 16% of the, the offshore area. And here you can see one that's, that's sort of forming out there in um, McCoy Bay and Casco Bay. And they always invariably border high bluffs of glacial marine mud. So here these bluffs are being eroded as the sea comes, uh, as the sea comes up and crosses them, but they go down. There's wells drilled here that go down hundreds of feet where this won't be eroded. This will be preserved. Uh, and as it erodes the new mud, it's creating by its own erosion and the trees and the other things will be deposited on top of it. Um, this is what it looks like directly offshore of that site. We, we went out and positioned ourselves. You can see on the seismic reflection record on the left, um, the seafloor, which is that upper, uh, uppermost line, which is just estuarine mud, is just very muddy, very soft, and cored through it very easily until we hit the ice age mud, the darker blue color I put there, which has a lot of laminations in it. And on the right side is the core showing clams, soft shell clams that were literally buried probably by a landslide from the bluff in place preserving them, really great to radiocarbon date them because they live at around low tide. And I could estimate that that's where low tide was 9,130 odd years ago. Uh, other things out there, we, they were first disappointing, then they became interesting. All the green you see are natural gas fields. You don't see them to the south in Saco or, or Wells because it's sandy there and the gas would bubble out, but they probably exist in every muddy embayment in the coast of Maine. This is just a detailed map and the Casco Bay in the upper left there, you can see a line that will go over one of these gas fields and you can see what it looks like there. Um, you can see the seafloor and it's muddy. You can see NG, that's natural gas. When the sound hits the natural gas in the mud, that natural gas is taking up five to 10% of the volume uh, of, of material that is between the, the sand grains or mud grains. And when my sound hits it, it literally, the bubble compresses and reflects the sound back up. So I can never look through it. Uh, it's, it just, it's opaque to me, which was disappointing when we first saw it. Where there isn't gas, you can see the glacial marine, you can see BR as bedrock. You can see this was a valley that's been filled with estuarine mud and glacial marine mud and now natural gas. But sometimes the natural gas escapes as it has here in Belfast Bay and here there are thousands of, we call them gas escape or fluid escape pockmarks. You, you can just see them as holes in the bottom there, long linear chains of them. The arrow is pointing to one that is the largest. And that is the size of the Rose Bowl with the stands, the whole stadium. If you took that and put it in that hole, it would come to the, to the, to the seafloor surface. 
So whatever building you're in probably would fit and hide in one of these things very easily. Uh, this is a rather staggering thing to, to find. We still don't know a lot about them. Um, here's the an image on the right side showing one that was active that led to a really cool paper. This is a side scan sonar image. So I'm just looking at the surface, but on the upper channel of it, uh, I'm tracking the bottom. That's how the, the device um, knows where to put everything that it, it observes. And you can see there's like a plume of material erupting from the bottom. On the record itself, you see these dark, uh, it says gas bubbles. It's probably bubbles and chunks of mud that have been blasted up. This was an erupting pockmark. Um, you can see the mud plume on the left was not collected at the same time. It was a different time and a different eruption from the bottom, but it, same idea. And then you can see when we went down in submersibles, we, we pulled up these vents and that's where the gas must be coming from. A um, lot of questions about this. Uh, I, it's a lot of questions that I've never answered and uh, I hope someday we will. Here you know, again, you can see Belfast Bay. We mapped the full extent of it. Laura Brothers uh, did that work. Uh, for her dissertation. You can see all the holes. There's about 2,300, I think. But just to give you an example, Blue Hill Bay, where we had occasion to do some more work, you can see hundreds uh, of them there as well, maybe more. Um, and as they go seaward, they seem to be eroded by tidal uh, processes, and there's not much left of them but a depression in the land. Where do they come from? That was a basic question. And when did they form? Uh, don't know. We don't really know. We need to sample the gas and we've never been able to get funded to do that. But here's one thought. Um, these are freshwater peatlands. You can see the map at the left, the freshwater swamp deposits. That's the same air photo you see on the right. And it's a freshwater bog and it's, it's eroding um, and it's being covered by a salt marsh. Um, and here you can see on the bottom, you can see another one, but that peak goes down quite a bit below the salt marsh. I thought, well, maybe this freshwater bog deposit uh, gets buried eventually by mud and, and then erupts, or maybe it was a lake, um, but we don't know. We've never been able to ascertain the, the origin of the, uh, of the gas, whether it came from river sediment, whether it's, well, we, we don't know its origin. Um, and I don't know when it happened. Was it an earthquake that shook everything and all the gas came up all at once? Uh, don't know. Finally, I'm getting down to the end here, the near shore ramp, mostly shallow water off our beaches, about 5% of the offshore area. Here, the one off the Kennebec River mouth, you can see the yellow is sand, the green is gravel, a vast uh, deltaic area. You can see submersible picture of it. And then a side scan sonar image showing all the ripples in the gravel uh, and sand, the light color there is sand. Uh, really extensive areas of sand, billions and billions of uh, cubic yards of sand. This is a seismic reflection profile through that delta where we wanted to hit some of those dipping beds, hoping we'd find something that would tell us when sea level reached that low stand location. Um, and we did, it was about 12,500 years ago. Similarly, off the Saco River, um, there's a lot of sand, not nearly as much, much smaller river than the Kennebec. Um, the low stand of sea level is out there at the, the, the most seaward position to the far right. Final two, don't have much to say about the gravel plain. Um, we were running out of money from some federal projects I was working on when we got up toward the Bay of Fundy. And um, it doesn't represent a lot of the seabed, but it continues on into the Bay of Fundy. It's an area with extreme, <coughs> excuse me, tidal, chain, uh, tidal currents. You can see the bottom in the seismic reflection image is just hard, rocky bottom, really whipped by currents moving one, two meters per second all through 24 hours a day. Um, a, a very different location owing to the extreme tides in the Bay of Fundy. Finally, the outer basin, just the outer boundary of this and going into the, the Gulf of Maine, I listed 16%, but it, it continues on into the Gulf of Maine. And what is seen here in the seismic reflection uh, image on the, on the left side is, uh, is the seabed on the, on the top with bedrock descending down, which is colored in red in the interpretation down below. But what we were looking for is an area that would have marked how low sea level fell. In other words, where were the trees able to grow and then 
you know, and then eventually they were drowned again. And we don't see that. This area was always underwater. It was never emergent. So there's no real distinction between the ice age and the modern. It's been accumulating mud for uh, the past 15,000 years. So that is a, a quick image of the Gulf of Maine inshore, uh, meaning the shallow water, the deeper waters of the Gulf of Maine are, are really a, a totally different story. Um, the general thing I take away from this is it's rockier inshore because the ocean uh, was once above this, it fell below it, waves reworked everything, then it rose back up and over it and really exposed a lot of that bedrock. You notice that the mud, the blue in that graph become more important at greater depths. That's where uh, the mud is now covering most of that rock. And the gravel and sand are kind of more or less constant. There's always a little bit of one or the other. Obviously off the near shore ramp, there are a bit more, but um, uh, that's what we can we can say that we know about the the seafloor out there today. I often conclude a talk like this to say, you know, every time you go out, something happens. I was with a seasoned captain, and this was within about a kilometer of the University of Maine's dock. Uh, but this wasn't chartered. There was a shoal there, and we hit it. We had half a million dollars of electronics on board, and we started to tip over, and would have, we would have lost it all. We had no way to get off. Um, we were yelling, we were radioing, but no one was going to get to us in time. But fortunately, the captain was a person who picked up wood whenever he found it. And we had a lot of boards on, on the boat, and we were able to prop it up until the sea came back. So accidents uh, can happen if you go offshore. Be careful. Thank you. So I've stopped my Thank share. You, yes. Uh, folks. If you have not already sent me your questions through the chat, feel free to do so now. Um, but first, we have a call to action for you all in relation to Maine's beautiful ocean. Negotiations for the Build Back Better Act are advancing in Congress, but funding levels for coastal restoration and resilience projects fall far short of addressing our nation's enormous coastal infrastructure needs. Congress has a once in a generation opportunity to invest in our coastal communities with the bold action this moment demands. Congresswoman Pingree has been championing these efforts, but Senators Collins and King and Congressman Golden need to hear from you. We will share a link in a follow up email this afternoon to make it easy for you to send a personal message to the whole delegation. And now we'll move on to questions. All right, let me scroll back up in the chat because we've gotten some good ones. Um, okay. So in the, actually if it's possible for you to share your screen again and go back to the uh, sea level rise graph you shared toward the start of your presentation. We have a question about that. And while you pull that up, um, I'll absorb the other question. I'm going to, yeah. yeah. Toggle back. That one. Ow. No, like way at the beginning, it was the, um, yes, you got it. Um, that? All right. And feel free to unmute Michaela and let me know if I'm, Picking up on the wrong feature. Oh, sorry, Joe, go, go back to the graph. I think I have a delay. Um, and once I can see it, I think she's asking what the, um, those almost like cross looking marks indicate. Ah, okay, I, I can explain this in, in enormous detail. Um, some of the ones on this image are colored because this was made for a talk where I was talking about some new information and I wanted to show where they were, but it fit within the others. The others you see points, these are radiocarbon dated points, mostly on that in, in, on the left side, are mostly uh, Maya Arenaria, the soft shelled clan. On the right side, it's salt marsh peat. And there are errors associated with this. Um, there are time errors, um, radiocarbon, there's a plus or minus with the radiocarbon date. And that's the horizontal line you see. And there are vertical errors. Uh, I mean, clams actually, if I was really being honest, clams can actually live very deep, but virtually all of them live near low tide. So I'm thinking that mean high water, which is what I'm graphing here, 
is just above the location of these, these samples. Uh, and so you see a, a vertical line indicating someplace within that horizontal era, vertical era, sea level probably was, or you know, mean high water was. So that's their error marks, that's all. I could take them out and, and feel more confident, but I wouldn't be. It's, uh, you know, there's, there are errors associated with measurement. Thank you. Um, our next question is, if a glacial and subglacial dam features are the cause of the deeply cut ocean landscapes in Maine, um, have similar features been found in the scab lands of eastern Washington state near where have there have been more recent glaciers? Yes, that's a great question. I, I got to visit there just a couple of years ago. This is western, the western U.S., uh, eastern Washington state. Um, now there, it wasn't a, a lake that was under a glacier. It was a lake that was dammed by a glacier. So the glacier cut off its access to, uh, to the ocean and a, and a really large lake built out in the Missoula, Montana area. And then the glacier moved back a little bit and catastrophically released large amounts of water that formed the landscape today we call the channeled scablands, huge waterfalls with no, no water anymore. Um, it would have been like that, except this was an entirely underwater situation. There was no land involved here. The glacier and the lake were both underwater and, and erupted out at, at high velocity. All right, next question. Can you discuss hydrostatic rebound and how the nearshore environment and coastal marshes are impacted by this? I know our salt marshes are faring better than southern states in part due to this. Sorry, isostatic rebound. Oh, okay. I was confused, but okay, yes. Isostatic uh, rebound. So isostasy is the balance between a load that is put on the Earth's surface and the Earth's rigid crust and the buoyancy that's offered by more liquid material, warmer material, far below the surface. So you could think of the Earth's crust as sort of like a waterbed and the glacier like a large brick that you're putting on it. It pushes down the waterbed, it pushes down the Earth's rigid crust and causes the liquid material beneath to be squeezed out in any direction it can go, wherever it's not being confined by, by this ice. For, for the case of Maine, um, if you think about it, the weight of you know, the, the, the density of ice and the density of rock are different. Ice is about one third as dense as rock. So for every three feet of ice, we probably push the Earth's crust down one foot. And that material that was pushed out from below to make room for that went down for us down south of, south of New York uh, into the middle Atlantic states and pushed them up. Now, since then, the ice has left Maine. We've rebounded. Well, where'd that material for our rebound come? Well, it came from the areas like the Middle Atlantic states where that material had been pushed out. It's, it's flowing back. At first it came rapidly, but it's still continuing to move in. Quebec is still rising out of the ocean. Sadly for the Middle Atlantic states, particularly for those who've built along the coastline there, uh, not only are they experiencing the, the rise of the ocean as a consequence of uh, melting glaciers and warming ocean today, they're also experiencing um, sinking land from this hot material down deep below flowing back into the north, raising us up. So they've got a kind of a double whammy and it's going to go on for quite some time. Maine is lucky. We actually straddle Canada, which is still being uplifted and southern areas, which are, are sinking rapidly. We're just about even, but in time we will also um, change, a we'll sink a little bit, but not very much. Uh, Ken asks, what bathymetry, materials, and other bottom characteristics are important to citing wind power? I don't know if you've thought about that at all. But... Yeah, I bought the, uh, the multi-beam bathymetric device to survey the site where the University of Maine was planning, well, did put in its um, test model station. Um, so what, 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 would, what would you want to know to, to, to put something like this in? Well, the intent of these is to be floating. So the original plan was to put something like a, uh, like a tin can uh, you know, that's been emptied out. It's called a, a suction caisson, but a really big one, like 20 feet deep and 
you know, six feet across and stick it down into the mud with then have a cable and you're pulling on a vacuum. You can't really pull that can out. And so the uh, the wind power is is safe there. So the, they were looking for areas of deep muds. So we ran multi-beam bathymetry and seismic reflection and were able to find a, a large enough area to do that. At some point they decided that that maybe was an engineering feat too far. They wanted now a gravity anchor. They just wanted to put some heavy massive weight on the bottom that would hold these things, uh, floating platforms in place. So we went back to look for a rocky area. I think when they come to deploying uh, wind plower out in federal waters, well offshore of the modern coast, they will be exclusively in mud and they will be in deep mud. And that's what they'll be looking for. They'll have no, no trouble finding it. It's, it's very abundant out there. That's a good question. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Um, Tom asks, can you describe the origins of Somme Sound? Yes. Somme Sound uh, is frequently called Maine's Fjord. Um, I, was, I once worked in state government and got myself in trouble with the tourism office when I, I said, nah, Maine doesn't have any fjords. If you want to see a fjord, you go to Alaska, or you go to Norway, you go to Newfoundland. It's a matter of scale. The, the geological or the definition of a fjord does not say how high the land is to either side. It does not say, you know, how deep it is. Um, so Somme Sound never really had any major river. If you, you know, it's, if you look, it's an island, it's a little island. It has a, a tiniest little stream coming in. Clearly it was entirely cut by glaciers. Um, and it goes up, I don't know, 700 feet or more on rock on either side, but it's, it's not quite as, as stunning as the <laughs> much, much higher uh, uh, fjords in, um, in other places, but it doesn't go down very deep either. Um, so it's only about 30, 40 meters deep. So it, it, the bedrock was carved by, by the glaciers and it unearthed it. It then was refilled by glacial marine mud for the most part, some modern mud. Uh, Somme Sound was a lake and there are glacial dams uh, at the seaward side of it, moraines. They're all eroded today. They're underwater still, and I, I have images of them. But that would have been Somme's Lake for mm, much of its history, maybe even most of its history. There are archaeological sites uh, nearby, and I'm, I'm not allowed to say where, but people live there, probably taking advantage of the salmon that might have come in and out of, uh, of the lake or other resources. So it is a unique feature. If you want to call it a, a fjord, I'll call it a fjord too, but it, but it isn't as, as spectacular as the fjords in Alaska and Newfoundland and, and Norway. So earlier you were showing us and describing how some features formed as the glacier lakes erupted and the boulders and sediment carved out um, deep channels really quickly. When you say a glacier carved out so sound, I think you mean it by a different mechanism. Will you describe that? Yes, I can. And I did. I, I should have been clearer. Um, when the glacier, glacier is, is made of ice and uh, ice, if you rub ice on, a, on rock, it will just abrade the ice. The ice is soft. It has no, no capacity under any circumstance to abrade uh, rock. But um, as the ice moves along, yeah, the rock is cracked and, and the ice, we say it plucks, but it incorporates a piece of rock or sand or mud within the glacier. And the glacier keeps on. Now it's at the bottom of a glacier. That glacier might be a mile thick. So you have a boulder or a sand grain or a pebble or mud even at the base of this ice that is under enormous pressure. And so it's grinding its way. That's how you, you, you form places like uh, Somme Sound. Um, for whatever reason, the rocks in, in, on Mount Desert Island are, have fractures, weak areas that are aligned pretty much north-south, same as uh, Somme's Sound. Um, and so there were weak areas there that once the glaciers came there, they were able to find a lot of broken up rock, incorporate it, and begin deepening. Many of the lakes, if you look at a map of Mount Desert Island, you'll see they share the orientation of Somme Sound, but they often have... Um, moraine still holding them back. Jordan Pond is supported by a moraine. The, the Jordan Pond house is built on it. Sadly, they took the boulders off the moraine to make room for tables, but it, it ruins it as a, a geological landform, but that's what it is. 
uh, Echo Lake, the swimming lake there in the park is also uh, built on a moraine. Um, Joe, could you recommend a book for beginners about underwater geology? Or well, you can go uh, to the main geological surveys website uh, and you can see under maps and publications, there's a publication I wrote called the uh, Underwater Landscapes of the Gulf of Maine is what it was called, similar to this title, some of the same images, uh, and it's a written book. It's PDF, it's free, you can download it. Um, you can download some of the maps that I showed that, that are also there. Uh, other than that, there hasn't been a lot written. Um, again, if you were off New Jersey, New York, South Carolina, there's not as much to look at. Um, it's not as, as, it hasn't been glaciated. Uh, there, there are some interesting things, don't, don't get me wrong, but so no, nobody's really been that excited. They eliminated the National Indice Research Program, I think in part because people weren't really using it in other areas. We were using it, but um, the program ended and uh, has not been uh, resuscitated. So I can't recommend much beyond what I, I wrote and if somebody needs a, you know, a direction, I can send you a PDF of it uh, if, if, if that would help. Um, a follow-up question for book recommendations. What about um, underwater archeology? span Ah, well, there are books on that. Person. And it, it's a fascinating topic. Again, much, there's, there's probably a great record offshore Occasionally, someone is dragging for scallops, as I mentioned before, and we'll pull up something and we think, well, maybe there really is something here. It's a big ocean to go and, and look for things, though. It's really not, um, it's not easy to find things. And, and I could have shown other places where, where I've done work with archaeologists. It works better when you're near shore. I've just been, we received a grant to look to do some work seaward of some eroding archaeological sites and to see how extensive these sites once were, if, if we can. But um, again, you see the kind of costs that are associated with this and the geophysical training required just to operate them and the geology training to, to use them. Archaeologists are not generally trained this way. And with one exception, the University of Southampton in the UK is just par excellence, one of the greatest uh, marine schools in the world, and they do have a, a marine archaeology program. We don't so much. I mean, it comes up, somebody finds something, they get money, I get a call, or somebody gets a call, and we can go out and look at things. They're putting in a utility line from the offshore wind power. That, though, that will happen on a large scale at some point. Well, they have to do detailed archaeological surveys where this cable is going to go. That'll involve the kind of work I've shown here. And if they see anything, you go to the next level, which will mean they'll be coring extensively. And if they really think there's something there, they're gonna have to just move the line. And uh, so, but you can understand how, how much more difficult it is to actually go there and begin to try to sample things. Most of what we found is just a lot of work and, and a lot of good luck. That is a perfect segue to the next question, which is for the offshore wind cables, do they need to run across muddy bottom with slow currents to avoid abrasion or does the, yeah. the bottom material not matter as much? Okay, I oh, know the bottom material is very important and I've done uh, work for people citing um, utility cables out to some of the islands. And at least my experience there was, um, they have a device that will like plow a muddy bottom. And at the same time, it puts this utility cable or you know, well, a power cable, whatever you're putting in the bottom about six feet down. And then as it continues to move on, it packs it over so that it's buried. They want it buried because they don't want someone accidentally dragging the bottom when they're fishing and hitting a power cable, which would be dreadful for all involved. So no, they're buried when, and I've done surveys so they could kind of try to follow a muddy path. If that becomes impossible and you notice all the rocky areas, it is impossible in a lot of locations, then they have to put it over the rock and I and they armor it with, with you know, gravel, not, not giant boulders, but so again, so it can't be uh, caught in some fishing gear. So the intent is to avoid any, any interaction with fishing gear by burying it 
in one fashion or another. Um, what are your thoughts on GRACE or other forms of remote sensing that are developing from satellites or space technologies? Have you been able to integrate any sort of this type of remote sensing data? Uh, the GRACE satellite is two satellites, really, and, and they measure the Earth's gravity very, very sensitively. Uh, they, they, they're looking down at the Earth, and when there's something, a stronger gravitational attraction, a larger mass, let's say, then one of the satellites will be drawn slightly closer, and, and then it will get away from there, it'll come back, and then the other one will go into it. And they can model what this mass is. Like, you can measure, directly measure changes in the volume of water in underwater, underground aquifers in California and in the Midwest, and really see that we're drawing down those bodies of water. You can measure the mass loss in Antarctica or Greenland by seeing how much less mass there is using the GRACE satellites. I have not ever had any occasion to do that. Again, we're not dealing with that, that scale. Um, <clears throat> You know, we're not Greenland and we're not these large aquifers. <coughs> I don't think there's anything I could I could ever contribute or use uh, uh, grace in my work uh, for. Joe, I know you said that we don't know a lot about the natural gas deposits, but I find that really fascinating. Um, you had said that the the gas is just like in between the grains of grains of clay are there also like bigger pockets of it as well i think yes but that's a that's a really good question and and i and I, i'm not sure the answer we don't know the answer the gas forms from the breakdown of organic matter so it, it just it, it's how natural gas forms it forms in landfills and it's not unusual for that. This is shallow water. We're never going to uh, you know, produce natural gas for our consumption from these deposits. There just isn't enough gas. We're talking about 5% or more of the volume of the space between sand or, or most likely mud grains uh, below the bottom. Um, but are there bigger concentrations? Well, that leads to the, these exploding fluid escape pockmarks. Pretty clearly, something was unusual about those places. Were there bigger pockets of gas again, or was it an earthquake? Uh, I don't know. Um, and the gas—I didn't say it. I—I I, I give a whole talk on the gas, but it, it migrates also, and it migrates along sand beds within them, trapped by mud on either side, and often erupts far from uh, where the gas was. So in Belfast Bay, most of the pockmarks are not are not over natural gas deposits. The, the gas has migrated to those locations and often it forms long linear chains of pockmarks that are striking really where the pressure of the water coming down equals the pressure of the gas trying to escape and suddenly you get a, a line of these things forming. There's a lot of good questions to ask about it. Uh, what is the pressure of the gas? Uh, I don't know the answer to any of those things, but in generally answering your question, I'd say that the pressure is not equal in all spots. There are probably bigger pockets in some areas than in others. And yes, they do erupt and they have been observed. I gave a talk on Islesboro once and uh, this fellow came, was, came forward and said, no, he'd been walking his dog and, and uh, he, he'd seen these bubbles and he could smell, he could smell hydrogen sulfide. You don't, you don't smell natural gas right out there in Belfast Bay. I shouldn't say what he said next, but I, it disappointed the audience when I gave a talk there. He said, then he saw the alien vessels uh, leave the water and, and we realized that maybe he wasn't a reliable witness. So I'll leave it at that. They, they, there are probably pockets of, of gas that do erupt from time to time. And, and I believe you said this earlier in your talk, but someone asked that there haven't been any carbon isotope dating studies done on the gas. No, and that's what you'd look for. There's different, carbon comes in different forms and the carbon isotopes in me have a ratio that's similar to all people and land things, but ocean ones are very different. And so a good sample of the gas, and believe me, I've tried to get some, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, um, would be required to, to do that. The oil industry could do this in a heartbeat. And I've often thought I ought to find someone in the industry who could just get up here, but 
when, when you involve the the oil industry, it's just it's just the costs uh, are staggering to, to to do these engineering things. Um, many many millions of dollars probably, and it's yeah the question probably isn't worth it unless you can come up with a, a, a clever or cheaper way to to figure that out. Um, yeah, All maybe right. the oil industry will look. That puts us at one o'clock. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you to the rest of you for joining us. I hope you'll join us again next week when recently appointed Public Utilities Commissioner Patrick Scully will join us to explain what the PUC does and why it's poised to play such a vital role in shaping Maine's clean energy future. Have a great weekend, everyone. And thank you again, Joe. Take thank care. you. Yep.